This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. In addition to being a recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant, our guest this week has received prizes from the Verbier Academy, Curtis Institute of Music, Melbourne International Chamber Music Competition, and the National Piano Competition of the Rubin Academy in Jerusalem, among others. Last year, Avi Records released his acclaimed album of works by and inspired by Schubert. He performs across the globe, and on March 10th will be giving a recital at New York City's Subculture, a concert that will include a world premiere by Tamar Muscal. His name is Benjamin Hochman, and we are very happy to see him on the show this morning. Benji, thanks for being here. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so in, in looking at what's actually coming up for you, um, I thought it'd be really great to have you on the show to talk about this program that's going to be at Subculture. It looks really, really interesting. It will include this world premiere. Um, I'm hoping we'll get to uh, the chance to talk about that piece and working on that piece. I'm looking forward to talking with you about that. Yeah. Um, so how did you decide this program? First of all, what, what's on it and why have you chosen these works for it? Um, this program is actually titled Variations, and it's a program entirely of contemporary piano variations. So it includes variations by Oliver Nussen, Luciano Berrio, a world premiere by Tamar Muscal, which is called Frederick Variations, and it's variations on a theme by Chopin, and Frederick Zhevsky, um, The People United Will Never Be Defeated, which is 36 variations on a Chilean resistance song. So it's kind of a cool program, and it's, a, it's an idea that's been brewing with me for some time. Um, I've always been interested in variations because it's such a basic musical form and there's so many incredible examples of music written in this form from all different periods, from very old music to very new music. And then when I was asked by the 92nd Street Y to play a recital at Subculture, which is a venue on Bleecker Street in NoHo in New York, um, I thought of doing something a little bit different from the traditional recitals that I tend to do uptown. Um, mm -hmm. Something about the location of the venue, the size of the venue, um, and maybe just an itch that I needed to scratch of doing more contemporary music kind of combined into doing this program. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, and I've, I've, you know, I've been to Subculture a number of times now, and it, uh, to be honest, it's kind of the perfect venue for something like this. I think it's, like a, a, it's perfect for recitals these days, I'd say. Um, I think so. You know, I, I, for a while, it seemed like LPR was the only game in town. But, you know, I think for New York, Subculture has provided another outlet, um, you know, another place to, to really, especially for CD releases that are coming out, too. That's very, it seems to be a popular place for that. Um, so, I mean, could you actually talk about the, this world premiere, actually, by um, Muscal? I'm, I, what, was the, what was it like working on this piece and putting it together? Was this like a very collaborative effort between you and Composer? Yeah. Well, I've known Tamal for actually quite a long time. Um, I've worked with her on a couple of pieces, a couple of premieres. We played um, a piano trio of hers at a festival in Maine um, that was titled Argaman, which, which means red in Hebrew. And um, I also played a piece by her for piano quartet and singer, which we did with Lucy Shelton, the incredible Lucy Shelton. Um, and so, and we're, we happen to be from the same town. We were both born and raised in Jerusalem. So... I've known Tamal for a while, we've worked together several times, and I've recorded some of her music as well, and so the last time we collaborated, she said to me, you know, I really want to write a piece for you, what can we do? And I said, that would be incredible, I would love to do that. And so we were just kind of waiting for the right moment um, for everything to come together, and then when I thought of doing this variations program, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to ask her to write something that would fit into that concept. So I suggested that she write a piece um, around the theme of variations, but I told her it could really be anything she wanted because variations can be interpreted in so many different ways. Um, and I gave her one other suggestion, which was just an idea of doing something that links into Chopin in some way, um, because Chopin is a composer I work with a lot, and I play a lot of his music, and I thought it could be interesting to combine that idea also. So what she did was she chose a theme, which is an etude by Chopin, and... Um, she wrote the piece, she sent me the score a few months ago, and um, I've been working on it, and then we started the process of working together. In fact, she was here yesterday, we had a very intense session, we spent about three and a half hours talking about the music, and this was after we had already emailed and had many phone conversations. So it's been a very interactive process, which is something that I really love doing, because I love having that contact 
with the composer, with the creator of the music. I, I always feel that I'm serving the music. I'm serving the composer who has the ideas, who creates the ideas. And so the beauty of working with composers who are alive is that you can talk to them. You can ask them, what does this mean? What does this indication mean? Can you sing this phrase for me? That's something that I've been actually asking her to do a lot. It's just, can you sing this phrase? Can you, can you just talk to me about this phrase? So it's been very interactive, and she's been right. a wonderful collaborator. I know this is something Dave and Sam feel very strongly about, um, the composer-performer relationship. Um, Dave, would you say that's appropriate for you? I, I'm curious about that, that act of singing the, the, the stuff from this piece and, and your communication kind of outside of the score. Um, what sorts of things are you getting from the way the composer is singing uh, the, the line that you're not getting just from, from looking at it or even discussing it verbally? Mm -hmm. Well, I always feel that what I see on the page is an approximation of what the composer has in mind. There are so many things that all of us as musicians um, think about the music that are kind of nonverbal, almost a little bit abstract, you know, something... Right something which is not just a piano or a forte or a staccato or a dash. And so even when composers are incredibly skilled at putting their ideas down into a, into a graphic form, I think there's something about going back to the basic idea of how does this phrase sound. So very often when I had some doubt about the pacing of a phrase, whether a ritardando is necessary, sometimes even a complex rhythm, which I understand intellectually but maybe haven't totally understood on a more basic primal instinct kind of way. So I love having the opportunity to say to the composer, just, just sing this for me. And then I know what they have in mind. And sometimes it's a better indication than just seeing the notes on the page. Do you ever uh, do that and, and get together with the composer and say, I know you wrote it this way, but did you consider this other thing and, and maybe contradict what's written on the page in that yes, way? I do. I do. <laughs> That's great. I, I, I mean, as a composer, I love that. I know some performers are uncomfortable with that, but I think it's great. Yeah, I love that too. And, you know, I love working with composers who are open to that kind of collaboration because, you know, I think it is a two-way street. Of course, the composer is the creator of the ideas, but sometimes having a little bit more distance from the music. Of course, composers are always so close to the music they created. And sometimes the performer has a little bit more distance and maybe a different point of view. And I think the combination and the dialogue that's created is extremely valuable. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Um, and and you, you bring up an interesting point about the, the idea of the authorship at that point, right? Is At some point, there's a final version of the piece and while it might say, you know, commissioned by or dedicated to the performer, it's the composer's name in the top right corner, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's the composer's name in, in, in the <clears throat> program when somebody else does it a year or nine later. Uh, and, and the premiering performer, even the commissioning premiering performer, may not have their name attached to it or even even known that far down the line. Yes. Um, so that's, a, that's a, I think that's always an interesting thing when you get into that is, is the issue of authorship. And then you can get into a point it's, if, if the interaction is deep enough between the composer and the performer where it does, I think, at some point make sense to share credit. But... Um, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't gotten to that point. I've talked to, uh, to people that have, but I, I always think it's interesting when the, the, the depth of the collaboration goes to the point of even contradicting some of the ideas that the composer mm -hmm. had about the piece. That's so yeah. interesting. That's you, really often interesting. Don't, you often don't get that story, yeah. um, you know, in the, in, the, in the history of a piece, but... Uh, I try to think, you know, if I see a score or, or something in the program notes where this piece was written for so-and-so, I have to imagine that there was a fairly strong collaboration. Yes, mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Go ahead. I was, yep. ben, I was oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Benji. I was just going to say that um, I think all of what you're saying is very true. And um, like Patrick was saying, I think there is something very special about a composer writing a piece for a performer in mind you know, really keeping that specific performer in mind, which has been the case with Tamal because I've known her and because she really thought of 
this program specifically and what she knows of my artistry. But at the same time, you know, like, like you were saying, um, the piece kind of takes on a life of its own. And of course, what I always wish for composers, if they write a piece for me, is that I'm only the first of many, many, many people who will play the piece. So I'm a strong believer in the life that the piece has for a very long time. And of course, I like to play the pieces that I commission, not only in the premiere, but also in the years to come. And I like to make it a permanent part of my repertoire. That said, I also hope that many of my colleagues see the beauty of the piece and perform it as much as possible. Right. I, so you said that you had this program in mind when you commissioned a work to be added to it. Um, how much did she take into account the other pieces on the program to, uh, I don't know, complement them in some way or, or maybe contrast them in some way? Uh, is that something that you spent a lot of time discussing with her? You know, the truth is that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about that with her. And the reason is, first of all, because I know her style of writing so well, I kind of knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with her musical language. And so that can even influence where it appears in the program, too. Right. So I did part of that process myself. In other words, I knew how I wanted her piece to complement the other pieces. Like I, I knew the concept that I had of the program as a whole. So, for example... I know that Tamal's musical language is very different from Oliver Nussin and very different from Luciano Berio and maybe a little bit more similar to Jevsky in some ways. And so I kind of had this in mind of creating a tapestry, if you will, or a musical meal that has different flavors, that has different um, even sizes because the Jevsky is such a monumental right. piece, it's almost an hour long. I knew that I couldn't have another 30-minute piece on the program if I wanted to stay alive. So... <laughs> <laughs> you want the audience to stay alive, too. Exactly. Right. That's exactly right. So, you know, I tried to give Tamal some pointers just in terms of, like, the length of the piece. I told her I didn't want it to be super long. You know, I suggested something like 10 to 12 minutes. It came out a few minutes longer than that, which is totally fine. Which is to be expected when you're dealing with a composer. That's right. Oh, good Lord. That's... Those people. <laughs> <laughs> but I always welcome that because you guys have so much to say. So that's a really cool thing. Yeah. See, so, I... I... I think that the what the way you're, the collaborative process you're talking about, even in the initial stages, is perfectly is is perfect for a composer because if you're a professional composer, you should be able to get some parameters like it's going to be paired with this and it can't be too long and it can't be too like this or whatever, and you should be able to do that. And you know, I think maybe some composers get offended. You know, you're trying to stifle me by telling me what to do, but. I think that's that's the way it should work. Exactly the what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get when you get in the big leagues, they, you know, I think it would, you know the commissions coming through. Like you know, they everyone knows that you need to have a certain you know if you're writing an orchestral piece or something. Yes, we need a 20 minute orchestral piece, or this needs to be a concert opener. I mean, it's just understood as to mm -hmm. how long it should be. I mean, the, that's that's a very fluid conversation that takes place throughout the whole process. Right. Absolutely. Unless you're Stockhausen. You need, you need an opener? Okay, I'm going to have to have an oboe player on a crane. <laughs> Get me a helicopter. Right. Yes. No, I, I mean, I like that kind of situational thing. It, it, it's create, creativity needs those kind of boundaries to kind of steer you in the right direction. And it reminds me a little bit, you know, this conversation reminds me a little bit of something we talked about last year or a couple of years ago now, the Hillary Hahn Encore Commissions. You know, she was looking for something very, very specific. I, you know, she said, I, I want a, like a two-minute piece for unaccompanied violin that is going to come immediately after this very impressive concerto that everybody loved enough to keep clapping enough to make me want to play another thing. So the, it's a pretty specific um, kind of emotional and intellectual state that everyone is in at that point. And what they want is, is kind of specific. And I'm sure what, what she wanted in the composers that she worked with was very specific. And this seems kind of like that, you know, you, you had a very specific program of theme and variations and you, you needed a thing. And I love the idea that I need about, you know, 12 minutes of stuff to fill out this program. And instead of, you know, digging through score libraries, say, oh, I'll just ask a composer to write something. Like, that'll, that, what better way to fill this, this hole in the program than by somebody to create a bespoke hole-filling piece there you go. to go right there into the thing? 
I see the yeah. the the complete Benji's program commissioning project. Where <laughs> yeah. So you give two recitals a year, and you program it out, and you say, "I need this piece to go between." You know, this X is and a, this should be like a social network it. thing. <laughs> like this is good. this is the hole in my <laughs> musical program. <laughs> Fill it. Yeah. What do you got? It's workshopping. It's workshopping. Totally. Yeah. No, and that's you know, great. The truth is that I. I, I feel that it's my responsibility to do my homework, to know who the composers are that I'm working with, and to, mm -hmm. to figure out how they're going to fit into my programming. You know, there's a reason that I asked Tamal for this specific piece, because I know her, I know her music, I know her abilities, and I admire her very much. Um, so I, I try to do my homework. I try to really think of what fits into the program. No, that's great. Um, I'm curious about the program itself. Yeah. Where where did the idea of theme and variations come from? That's uh, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of theme and variations because I think it's something that that everybody can hear. It's it's a it's a musical device that's that's very easy even for people that haven't you know taken 17 graduate music theory classes to hear a theme and variations. I'm curious what what draws you to to that idea. Yes. So I think what you're saying is a big part of it, that I think there's something so primal and basic about this musical form. Um, you know, we hear it in popular music, we hear it in old music and new music. It's something which is instantly recognizable and such a basic idea, and yet there's such incredible diversity in the variations that have been written over hundreds of years. Um, so, you know, for example, pieces like the Goldberg Variations, which is a piece that I've played a lot, um, or certain variation sets within Beethoven, late Beethoven sonatas, like Opus 109, um, Opus 111. These are pieces that we all know and love. And it's interesting to see how variations through the different periods have evolved and changed. And especially in the 20th and 21st century, I think variations have kind of gone in a really interesting direction. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, of the Webern Variations, which is a piece that I played a lot and recorded. And... You know, it's actually difficult to hear what makes this piece a ver theme in variations. So in that sense, it's a little bit obscure and strange. And yet at the same time, it's one of the most beautiful pieces that I know. Um, so I guess variations is something that I've come back to in different ways over the years. And I'm not quite sure exactly how this particular idea kind of took flight. But I guess I was thinking of variations and I was thinking of the diversity of different composers. And just I love the, piece on, the pieces on this program. Um, the Oliver Nussen is about eight minutes long. It's a compact, beautiful piece. Every note is exactly in the right place. It's incredibly colorful and imaginative. Um, it's a piece that I've wanted to play for a long time. The Luciano Berrio Cinque Valiazioni is an early piece in his career, um, dedicated to Dalla Piccola. So it's kind of in that Italian tradition. And actually, both the Nussen and the Berrio, they are variations and you can hear it, but you have to listen pretty closely. You know, I think it's the kind of piece that if you hear it for the first time, you definitely want to hear it again because it's so interesting and so intriguing, but you won't get everything on the first hearing. And so I think these pieces, um, they have tremendous impact, but they also kind of pique your curiosity. That was my experience when I first got exposed to these pieces. I, I loved them, but I knew that I needed more time to really go in depth into them. And then the Zhevsky is a piece that I've wanted to do for years. Um, I discovered it maybe about 15 years ago when I heard a recording of Ursula Oppens playing it. And I was kind of obsessed with this piece. And I, I knew I wanted to play it sometime, but I didn't have the time to learn it. And I didn't know how to fit it into a program. And so it took a while until I actually finally learned it and, and programmed it. And I've been playing it actually quite a lot this year, um, including at the Kennedy Center a few weeks ago. So I guess the thing about variations is that they interest me as a form. There are a lot of beautiful pieces in this form, and I think it's diverse enough that you won't get bored hearing so many variations. With that's yeah. my least. It's interesting to me that sort of the geeky composer angle is that variations is something like we you you would learn about theme and variations as an example in a tonal forms class, but it exists in exactly the same way it existed for Mozart, it exists for contemporary composers, because even if you're not using the same musical language, the idea perfectly translates from then to now, giving you something and then variations on the something, and how that thing is defined and the parameters that make up its variations can be anything. They don't have to be, you know, 
what what they were back when Mozart was doing it. So it's a it has a lot of it's timeless, I guess you would say. That's what I think is cool about it. I would totally agree. It's very with flexible. That. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's flexible. It, it it takes you know Mozart composition materials and it takes Dave McDonald composition materials and it's... will work just fine in both contexts. Yeah, a sonata allegro form would not, as an example. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. I think. Uh, well, I think it would be harder to I think make it's great work. that um, that ninety second Street Y is a co presenter of this concert because I'm um, they're they're a presenter that will give you license to really do some programming like this or play the pieces that you want, whereas others might be a little like, oh, I don't know if we can do that. So I think it's good yeah, what because... Do you, what do you got in the Schubert family? <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the... Uh, total uh, there, run? Might, there, might, there might be a little Schubert that pops up at the end of this concert. Who knows? Sure. What's, the, uh, <laughs> what's the total runtime of the show, Benji? So it should be about, um, I want to say, 80, 85 minutes. 85 minutes of music. And so you're going to have an intermission? Yes. So it's yes. going to be Nussin, Berio, Muscal for the first half, intermission, and then Nizhevsky. Yeah, that's what I would – you kind of put, pretty much have to do it that way. <laughs> yeah, and you spend the whole intermission psyching yourself out for the Zhevsky. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> I'm really envious, Patrick. You should go see this. I'm in, I would love to go and sit and yeah. watch this perform live. Please come. <laughs> I, I think I might have to. <laughs> yeah. I'm a um, huge fan of the Zhevsky. It's such a, a, a like like you said. It's a, it's a marathon, but it also it's not just you know like a minimalist kind of treading water for a long period of time. There's a lot of stuff going on for an hour, yeah. and uh, it's just and it's it's all it's so diverse. We talked about all the different ways that you can conceive of varying a thing and they're pretty much all in that one <laughs> yeah um so it's, it's it's a really nice representation of what theme and variations can be in all its many many forms um, right. and it's it's going- so it's so deep but also very approachable and it's uh, and, and 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 it's such an impressive piece of virtuosity as well uh in in some of those variations are you going all from memory benji you know, I'm not. I'm playing the Zhevsky from music, and that's a decision I made because I didn't want to have to worry about it. And I think, in a sense, it's not the point of the piece. It's, it's no. not that important. In fact, I've seen recordings of, of Zhevsky himself playing with music. So I think it's kind of not about that. But, you know, the cool thing about the Zhevsky is that, in my experience, it's a piece that the audience connects with in such a powerful way. Mm-hmm. And that's been, that's been a really incredible thing to see as I've played this piece this season and I've played it in, in different places from house concerts to the Kennedy Center. And I find that wherever I play it, people have a deep experience listening to this piece. And I think there's something about the nature of the journey. You know, people really feel that they've gone through something. And I think part of that is the length of the piece. And I think part of that is um, just the, the content, you know, the, the feeling that he's almost cataloging everything about the music of our time. It's so incredibly diverse. You know, you, you hear jazz, you hear minimalism, you hear some serial things, you hear virtuosity, you hear Rachmaninoff, you hear everything. And so I think it, it has an impact, which is very powerful. Yeah. And, and the, the nature of the theme for it is, really lends itself to feeling very kind of triumphant when you recognize it and, and when, you, when it comes back you're like, yeah, that's that's the thing I know and love. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm. Oh, well, absolutely, I agree with you. No, I think it's cool that most of the time when you know a piece is going to be an hour long, your initial impression of what it's probably like is there's lots of slow parts where there's not a lot of action, and you've got to be real patient. Mm-hmm. And that's true of a lot of pieces, but it's weird. This one is like there's something to hang on to the whole time for a solid hour. So that's exactly right. This is so, like easy listening. You know, it's an easy hour. Yeah. So, so after this concert, um, what else can we look forward to um, coming up for you? Yeah, so um, one of the things I'm really excited about is I'm doing a, a Bach recital in Santa Fe this summer, which is Bach partitas together with Della Piccola. Della Piccola has a piece um, inspired by Bach, uh, which is called Quaderno Musicale di Anna Libera. Excuse my pronunciation in Italian, but um, it's inspired by Anna Magdalena Bach and the notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach, and it has um, short pieces based on the BACH theme. And so this is kind of a direction of programming that I'm very interested in, and I think soon we're going to talk more about this, is I like this idea of taking music, which is in the core repertoire, which I think 
is so important and incredible, and I have something to say in it, but at the same time, um, juxtapose it with pieces that sort of create a dialogue, create a conversation, specifically 20th and 21st century works, and in some cases, commissions. So that's that's one thing I'm very excited about. I think it's um it's it's credible that composers still get mileage out of the B A C H, uh you know even, like people from, well I guess William Schumann to, to uh, from what you from all the, all the composers that we've spoken about before. I mean, it's that's kind of an incredible thing. It's it, with Shostakovich as well. That's right. Yeah. Well, you you named some names, Patrick, but also like probably thirteen percent of all freshman composition majors, <laughs> something in that neighborhood, also do the Bach theme and something they're working on. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? I don't. I don't think I. I have. did not. Well, so I think we're disproving that because I don't think I did either. <laughs> well, we'd we'd need a b- bigger sample size to really determine. I suppose. I suppose my statistics professors would be disappointed in in that survey that I just did. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, should we should we move on to a couple of news items here? Sure. What do you got? Yeah. I don't. I don't. Know. What do you got? Uh, well, tell us about tell us about this new, new program that's so, out. So, well, there's a number of of new pro. There's always new programs. You know, it's the nature of programs. Um, but there's, uh, you know, if you're a Sibelius user, and we talked about this when it was announced. Uh, I know we have a lot of people listening to the show that are composers. Um, and of course, you know, part of that is um, making your stuff look nice and make sense to other people, to, to people like Benji when they look at it, that it that it looks like a thing that they would want to do. Um, and Sibelius is is a big part of that. Sibelius, as we've discussed, got rid of all of the main developers on Sibelius and hired a completely new development team. This past summer would have been the usual time frame for them to release a new uh, update to Sibelius. would have been 8, Sibelius 8, and uh, they didn't, I assume in part because they got rid of all the people that knew how to develop Sibelius. Um, so they are releasing just on Friday, as we're recording this, just a couple of days ago, they announced the release of Sibelius 7.5. Um, I have not had a chance to play with it yet, but it does have some uh, interesting features. Some of them don't seem really that significant uh, to me. You have some new export options. Um, you can export things more easily to some of the, the other applications. Uh, you can export more easily to the Scorch kind of web application. Um, you can export things to a YouTube video, which is really interesting. Um, the, the Scorch thing works fantastically. I have a student who comes in and his stuff, he just sits down at the computer in the room we're in and pulls up his work online and we can actually look at it and make edits right there. It's really, it works wow. really great. Yeah. And, and there's a, there's mobile apps as well. Uh, I know at least uh, for, for iPad, I, I don't know about Android, but they have mobile apps that you can look at, which is really handy for slapping something on a music stand. Um, and and as you said, Sam, the the web thing works really well too. Um, the the YouTube video I think is kind of interesting, where it seems to I and I say, again I haven't tried it. What it what what it seems to be doing is slapping together a score video that plays the music and follows the score, which is pretty yeah. cool. Pretty cool. Um, and, will, and the, the MIDI way, will Benji. be synced into when the video changes. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's that's the oh, impression wow. I am getting. By the way, Benji, there's a great uh, if for anybody who wants to get a preview of your show. There's a great uh, score video for the Shevsky piece on YouTube, like the entire thing where you're scrolling through the score, watching. Well, so what I was thinking I would <laughs> want to do YouTube. with this feature in Sibelius would be to have it do the thing with the score and pump out a version of the score, but then pull it into a video editor and replace the audio track with a perform with a performance recording, and then have yeah. the performance lineup. With you the, already assuming you stick pretty close to tempo. Yeah, you've got, you got to be pretty, pretty close with that. <laughs> yeah, you're close enough. Yeah, you could tweak it here and there to match it up, but it would be pretty close to matching. I think it would be pretty neat. Um, but anyway, most of the features in here don't strike me as that, um, you know, impressive. It's it's a well, minor upgrade, but it is a paid upgrade, so it's um, between fifty and one hundred and fifty bucks, depending on what kind of Sibelius license you have right now. So it's not as much as a full version of a new big update to Sibelius, but it is a, a little update. Um, so if you are a Sibelius user, you should check it out. It's it's competing with the new version of Finale that just came out, which is, uh, a, a, I think, a much bigger update, and we'll, we'll look for a, a bigger update to Sibelius in the future. I, a rather compulsive 
upgrader uh and and avid sibelius user no pun intended whoa, 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 see what whoa, i did there whoa. avid sibelius. And I'm an avid sibelius user yeah yeah uh i uh <laughs> i really didn't mean to do that um i'm probably not gonna upgrade i'll i'll do the trial i'll give a review in the future but I'm, um i'm gonna hold off for now sam Day the feature that this has, I have Finale 2014, and it doesn't have anything like this. And I, looking at the screenshot of it and the story we're looking at, it looks like a more complicated or more uh, comprehensive version of things I've seen in my students. I've had to reckon with Sibelius because of students. But the uh, what they call the timeline window, where it looks like what you're looking at is like a um, sequencer track. You know, with like a window that you drag around. Yeah. So to me, that is very useful when dealing with big scores because you're looking at a zone in a compact version and then you grab the box and move it around to different zones that you want to look at. That's a much easier way to navigate through big scores. Yeah, I think I would be interested in trying something like that. Um, the... If I could do something like I would like the music that I'm writing now to start like two minutes into the piece and not mm -hmm. have to worry about figuring out how to fill the space beforehand just right now, mm -hmm. that would be very cool to me. And, yeah. and then I could work at different points thinking about it in time as opposed to thinking about it in measures because I'm I'm frequently you know changing meters, and if you change the meter from one thing to another thing, every measure of rest that's in that space is going to take a dramatically different amount of time. Right. So that's always uh, a, a thing that I contend with is trying to figure out where to place the thing that I'm working on. When you know I'm not much of a I don't do a lot of scaffolding before I start writing, but I do often do kind of short-term scaffolding where I, I, am, I know where I am now and I know where I want to be in 45 seconds or a minute from where let, I am let me, now. Let me paraphrase for you, Dave. The, the current design favors top-down thinking when you compose. How's yeah. That? Well, I mean, I feel like that's, that's the way a lot of things work. It's just easier yeah. to, to, to write a program that does that. But Benji, I'm with you, do you, I, do you, uh, do you happen to use... Any uh, notational program? Uh, have you played? Have you played around with Sibelius or Finale or anything no, like that? I haven't really. I just hear about it from my composer friends. <laughs> <laughs> and how much of a pain in the ass it is. It's always painful. Essentially, essentially. It's, it's incredible how much work you guys do beyond just active composition, but all these things like making parts and notation. I, I'm sure it's no joke. Uh, yeah. All right. That's enough nerd. That's nerd. enough nerd time. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think we got that squared away <laughs> the cool stuff now we move to the cool stuff we talked about this last year um the new music usa project grants new, new music usa uh, you might know them better as uh american music center or um oh gosh what was the other group composer. meet the composer meet the composer thank you uh got together they they had a little baby and named it new music usa and uh we call it their love child if you absolutely must their love child. Um, and they have completely revamped the way that they do grants now. And now they've got a centralized system. They've simplified the different uh, kinds of grants that you get. There's kind of just, they're kind of all in the same category. There aren't, there's not, you know, different categories for different kinds of projects and different deadlines all the time and different submission requirements. Now it's all one thing. It's just a project. You're doing a project. We got a grant for that. Um, so, it's it's all streamlined. It's all online. You can have collaborators. It's very cool. They had their first deadline last year. They've just announced the people that received those grants. Uh, so that is is very very exciting. Um, they have uh, granted. Let's see. They they received one thousand six hundred eighteen project applications. So that is is amazing. And I think shows how much easier they have made the granting process, which is really great, so they can really get the best stuff. Um, and you can now look at the projects that they have selected on the on the New Music USA site. All yeah, of the projects that were selected have a project page that you can follow, and you can follow um, on on their system. 
I wish they had some kind of like RSS feed or Twitter feed or something that was just automatically generated whenever there was an update to the project. Um, and, and maybe there is something like that and I just can't find it. Um, but they do have a system where you can like log in and sign up to get updates about these projects. And they all have these really beautiful pages. Check, check these out, right? This is an Ice Lab project, the great uh, Ice people that we, we've had some of these guys on the show before. Um, and you can see all of their different updates. You can see some of the things that they've done in the past. Well, they're also um, kind of creating an, a network of sorts, too, because what you do is you create a profile if you are yeah. a person who is or, or is looking for, for, for a grant or you're involved in one of the projects. Um, and you can tag yourself being associated with different grants, I believe. Yeah. And I think you can then contribute to the materials that go on the pages for the things that you're associated with. Mm-hmm. Like even if you're a performer, it's, an, it's a, you know, if you need all of these grants are... Um, you know, they go across composer, performer, presenter, I believe, too. Yeah, I think presenters are, are, are a thing that they award as well. They're, they're looking for anybody that's, that's presenting music in any way. Right. Um, now, here's one thing, though. I, unnamed individuals on the interwebs were complaining. I'm sure very reliable, though. When we're complaining when this list came out that, <laughs> like, everybody that got a grant was, like, already or – most of the people who got grants were already big, well-funded institutions. Yeah, I, d- I noticed something similar when I saw it. There were a lot of big name organizations that I recognize. And you see the same thing, though, with all kinds of these grants. You know, when you look at the people that are getting big grants from the NEA, it's the New York Philharmonic and, and it's not Ice Lab. And now when you drill down a little bit to... New Music USA, it's Ice Lab and not, I, I mean, I don't know what, contemporaneous or something. Um, so I th- feel like that's always going to happen because you're trying to show them that, that this is going to be money well invested in a project that is going to be worthwhile and valuable. Um, sure. you got to start doing smaller projects and then eventually you'll be able to get a grant for your, your oboist crane helicopter project. Just, just trying to, just trying to play devil's advocate. It's called, it's called journalistic integrity, Dave. I wouldn't know anything about it. <laughs> Perhaps you could tell me sometime. No, the, you should sit and look through all the, uh, the uh, projects. Though there's some really cool ones coming up. Yeah, we, we encourage everybody to to check this out and 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 share them on social media. They're very shareable because there's a lot of media on these pages there's photos and videos and it's it's a it's a cool thing and it, I, as i said making it easier and more interesting to apply for a grant is not an easy problem to solve and i think they've done a really good job at it so yeah um congratulations yep. to to both uh new music usa and all of the people that that uh, got those grants and and even all the people that applied because it's a it's a cool new thing and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stuff that comes from this. We'll we'll keep in touch with some of these projects. Uh, what else do we have, Patrick? Um, well, you know who, you know what organization actually has quite a bit of money. Um, you know the New York Yankees. <laughs> the New York Yankees. In addition to the New York Yankees, I believe it's also the Metropolitan Opera. Never heard of him. Uh, yeah. What does he do? Really? What does he do? He 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 does he does the musics. Uh, it's at it's at Lincoln's Lincoln like, Lincoln like Katy Place Perry? something like yeah yeah like that. Okay. So there's not a whole lot uh, of a story here. The the story is. They're entering negotia- negotiations for the next season now, and concessions are being asked for, and concessions obviously aren't wanting to be given as is to be expected. Hence, this is the pull quote from the end of the piece. Uh, this is a person, I can't remember the person's name, but a representative for the Met itself. It would be prudent for all Met employees to anticipate and prepare for the absence of Met income in the fall and winter of 2014, and perhaps even longer. It says, it says that at the end. So. Huh? Yeah. This is upcoming, uh, upcoming union negotiations at the Met. Yikes. Which Peter, which Peter Gelb is going to handle personally for the first time. And they're doing yeah. a new commission this season, right? 
Isn't there there's a new opera on the on the program? Is it the Nico Muley thing? No, that was last season. Mm, this, what am I thinking? Then? Season was, there, I thought there wait, was a no. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, this is Nico Muley. Two boys was this past fall, right? I mean, maybe um, I'm imagining things. Well, but they it, came out with there was a release that kind of highlighted all like a bunch of new works that were going to be coming. Like, there's going to be a Golihov opera in like 1819, um, and there are a few other commissions coming up too. Did Benji? Did you? Do you happen to know off the top of your head? The new, I don't remember new a commission, but I think there may have been a Sarajevo opera, which is not a premiere, but I think they might be presenting that. Maybe that's what I'm thinking Probably of. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll be we'll be very interested to follow how this goes. We've we've been talking about all kinds of labor issues in in music, and in fact, next week we'll we'll be talking to uh, senior orchestra business correspondent Drew McManus. There about uh about about uh these these sorts of things we haven't spoken with him for a while and he's got some really cool projects going on at adaptistration um and so we'll have to ask him about this but it seems like the the threshold for having these kinds of problems is creeping up the budget scale yeah so it used to be that just <laughs> the the little tiny regional orchestras were having these kinds of problems and then slightly larger and larger and larger and if the Met is starting to have these problems i mean we we even talked about Chicago Symphony last season for for you know what was it a day or a week or something yeah. um but i think I think San Gilb is Francisco I think Chicago. Gilb is wising up oh yeah San Francisco he, too Gilb is wising up and he's trying to massively uh under promise and then over deliver. So, like, make it sound like things are going to stop, and if they just continue with the season, it'll be a huge victory. Right. We'll so. see. We've been we've been mean to Peter Geld before on the show, but I wish him. I wish. Him I, I, I predict that we will be again in the future. Actually, <laughs> maybe it didn't catch on the first time I did it, but when you have a massive PR faux pas, I suggested calling it pulling a Gelb. So we'll see if he if he lives up to the to, to that moniker this time around. But best of luck to him, really. There, there is some Adams. It looks like on the program. Um, yes, it's, it's the Klinghoffer old Adams. It's Klinghoffer, but uh, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Anyway, this is uh, the first time at the Met, though. That is amazing to me that Klinghoffer so, has never been is, done uh, at the Met. How is that not? It's time. I guess it's kind of smaller scale than something like Nixon, but well, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's taken, it's gone around, I mean, it's a 19, I believe the first production was in 1991, um, in San Francisco, I believe, but it's gone around, it's gone around, just hasn't made it to the Met yet, so. Well, they're doing their Cavalier Rusticana Pagliacci this, this season, so that was close, it's been, all, I'm sure, at least five years since they've done <laughs> that. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> see, I months. can still be mean to Peter Gell, but we're still <laughs> in... And, well, they gotta listen. There, there are reasons why certain operas are are staged the Met every basically every season because they sell all the tickets. Yeah. Um, should we should we move should we move on? Are we I, we got I, it. I think uh, I think we're done. Time for the pick of the week. We're we gonna we're we gonna uh, yes, have a pick of the week, or am I just going week. crazy? The pick. No, I, I, th- <laughs> I think the pick of the week should be Benji's Schubert album. To be yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a few tracks from 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 Benji's album of of Schubert and Schubert inspired newer stuff. Um, so we didn't really talk about this album when we were talking to you earlier. But do, do you want to maybe explain what this project was? This is a recent album, right? It just came out at the end of last year. Yeah, it was released in November. It's titled "Homage to Schubert," and the title comes um, from a very small but very beautiful piece by Kurtag, the great Hungarian composer, titled Homage to Schubert. And that's the concept of the album. It has two um, beautiful Schubert sonatas, the A major sonata, Deutsch 664, and the D major sonata. Um, And in between, it has the Kurtag Homage to Schubert and a new work by Jörg Wiedmann titled Six Schubert Reminiscences. So it really looks at Schubert's music and contemporary responses to his music. And it's, it's a project that's very dear to me. And thanks for telling the folks about it. Uh, so if we're going to play just a little bit of it, uh, do, would, you, would you think we should go with the, uh, the, the Kurtag or the Wiedmann? Both good choices. Just depends what you're in the mood for. <laughs> Let's go with the Wiedmann. I agree because I, I think I've probably heard the the, the Kurtog before. Um, 
So we have uh, just some selections uh, from the piece. So we'll play a little bit from the from the top of this. This is from the first movement of uh, Vidman's. Uh, I guess I'm going to say idyll. Is that how you say those words? Right. Yeah. I I I'm never sure. Uh, idyll and abyss. Dave's a professional. I am very professional. That's how you know that we planned <laughs> this so far in advance. Um, <laughs> this is idyll and abyss by Vidman, performed by our guest Benjamin Hookman. So that was an excerpt from Idyll and Abyss from our guest, uh, Benjamin Hochman's album, Homage to Schubert. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Benji. That was really, really pleasure. cool. My pleasure. Um, I, the, the main melody there is this very beautiful, lyrical, romantic Schubert song kind of melody, and it, I feel like it's kind of like dragging the rest of the voices along with it. It's, it's, it's so, I mean, it's, I feel that way in a lot of Schubert songs as well, where it's so sinewy and, and flexible and, and, and the different pieces are kind of just oozing forth at their own pace. Um, it's a really cool piece. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and we'll have a, uh, we'll have links to, uh, to buy this album uh, in the show notes later on in the episode when this is posted. So yeah, everyone should be sure soundnotion.tv slash SN. You places, places to buy the album will be oozing forth. Indeed. <laughs> this doesn't sound gross when I say that, does it? Or, or wrong. Like, that's not, that's not insulting that, it's, that I'm describing the music that you're playing as oozing. I don't know. Say it again. I, 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 well, Just if it was sure. insulting, maybe I shouldn't. No, I wasn't insulted at all. Okay. It didn't sound insulting. <laughs> you know what I mean, though, right? Is or yeah, am I just I like making don't. no sense at all? No, I completely understand what you meant. Maybe uh, maybe dripping might be a better dripping tree. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't have the viscosity that I need. There you go. Um, before we go, <laughs> Benji, do you have anything uh, that we didn't talk about yet that you want to plug that you have coming up? I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. It's been really fun talking to you. Thanks for having me. It's, it's been our pleasure. We've had a great time this morning. Uh, if, you, if you're if you just joining us live and you missed some of the beginning, you can catch this and all of our shows at Sound Notion TV network of audio and video show things on the interwebs at soundnotion.tv. Uh, this show and the show notes for this show and the links to the things that we talked about and, and the things that Benji is working on and the album that we just played a little bit of – uh, are also on that site, soundnotion.tv slash SN will get you to the page for this particular uh, series. Um, if you're interested in anything else that we do, we've got a show that launched recently called Patch In, uh, which is about electronic music. They did a really interesting uh, show this week with a guy who's working on a new kind of uh, instrument controller that draws in different things that a performer does with their body and different light sources and temperature things and the motions that they do and incorporates those into the piece in some ways. It's a very cool project and it's uh, another Kickstarter thing. Um, so if you're interested, you should check that out. We're going to record a show uh, tonight after the Oscars of our film music show. <laughs> what do you got? What's that funny, Sam? 
I just, it's like it, you're really close to doing like the simulcast, you know. With, <laughs> we should. Uh, it's we, totally. Kevin and Bill sitting there talking, you know, responding live as they hear the result. It's going to be like uh, like the libertarian presidential candidate streaming himself, <laughs> shouting at the television during the presidential <laughs> debates that he couldn't get into. That's what we, that we should totally do that. That's it. Um, <laughs> but you, if, if you're not going to watch that live, you can check that out if you're curious to hear what, what Kevin and Bill think about the selections uh, for the, the the Academy Awards. They've already discussed their thoughts on the uh, the nominations. And I know I plugged this last week, but it was an awesome show. So you really need to check out uh, all the cool parts with Anthony Landman. Uh, it was, was recently relaunched here at Sound Ocean TV. Uh, it's a great audio show, interview show. And he talked to the founder or one of the founders of Roomful of Teeth which uh, was a, just won a Grammy for their amazing vocal performance of, uh, of Partita for Eight Voices, uh, which just won the Pulitzer last year. So they are just... They also just won a New Music USA grant. Yes, and a New Music other- USA grant. So they're basically kicking all the ass in the universe. And <laughs> it's a really interesting conversation. You should, you should definitely check it out. Uh, and that's all at soundnotion.tv. Uh, that one is soundnotion.tv slash ACP for all the cool parts. Um, what do I usually say at this point? Follow Join us, us on, on Facebook. Twitter. <laughs> like us on Facebook. Do all that. You know, subscribe to us on YouTube. Comment on the show. We would love to continue these conversations after the fact. Uh, and, and please do that in those places. Uh, we enjoy speaking with you. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that using the Amazon affiliate box on our site. Gives us a little commission. Doesn't cost you any more money. Uh, we have a great time. Thank you to everyone for joining us. You can follow us all on Twitter uh, as a group. We're at Sound Notion. If you want to send us a story to talk about on the show, use hashtag SNWeekly, and we check that out as we're putting the show together. I'm at Dave McDow. Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Sam is at Housegoy. And Benjamin is at Benjamin Hookman. So uh, you should follow us all on the Twitter machine, and we'll continue this conversation uh, later. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by our own Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Left. Thank you again so much for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. Losing four. <laughs>